Uh, well, I'd like to welcome everyone that's here. If you're not here, uh, hurry up and get here because we're starting. Uh, we have Laurie Moncrief uh, with us today. She's going to be bringing you beyond SBIR, STTR basics. And as I spoke with her earlier and we've talked about this, one of the things we're trying to do is understand that uh, our Tech Innovation Center uh, is limited with our resources as far as the people we are and what we can do. And one of the things we're trying to do is help everyone uh, that uh, looks at as a, as a business uh, advisor to understand that you have the capability to work with your client beyond just normal basic information and that SBIR and STTR, as much as it is a program, there are very specific nuances in different uh, agencies and the different programs. And if we can take the time to listen to, the, to some of the nuances and maybe demystify some of the secrets, uh, we can understand that we can, we can all take a part in taking this as a tool and helping certain clients. Uh, with that in mind, I'll turn it over to Lori. Oh, well, I guess before I do, we, we should have a little bit of, of uh, Q&A information. If you have a question along the way, uh, please uh, type in the question as we're going uh, so where we can spot the question, we can uh, give it to Lori and she can answer the question along the way. I think that's the easiest way, isn't it, Mindy? Yeah, that would be the easiest way is just to put in your question in the Q&A chat box at the yeah. bottom of your screen. Yeah. So with that in mind, Laurie, I'll turn it over to you. Appreciate it. I hope everybody's having a great day. So, so one of the things um, Alan touched on some of the goals, but the basic bottom line is we want to make the best use of the SBDC tech counselor's time. And at the same time, we want to make the best use of our small businesses' time because we're all time constrained and the, we all need results. So, Alan, if you'd go ahead and pull up the first slide, I'm going to just go over some basics of SBIR and the way I think that we can best get results. So, so the goals of SBIR is meet R&D needs, increase commercialization, stimulate tech innovation, and foster getting socially disadvantaged in the program. And all of this means the same thing, again, in that results. We need to focus on rethinking how we guide these small businesses for everybody's benefit, because we need the SBDCs to get the best results and we need these small businesses to get the, the, the best results. And I think in understanding the program full, um, more fully, we can understand ways to guide these small businesses better in times when it's best to encourage small businesses to proceed with an SBIR or not. In some instances, um, the best thing we can do is to encourage them to look at other avenues. So go ahead, Ellen. So um, I, I, I want to bring forth some information that you may not be aware of, um, and that's how did this all get created? Um, the SBA was created under the Small Business Act in 1953. And when the SBA Small Business Act was created, or the, I guess the, I should say that different, small business was, the SBA was created, and when it was created, the Small Business Act was created. And what that basically says is it gives the overall policy for directives for the program in general to the SBA. And that overall resides under John Williams, who's out of SBA headquarters. And, and then Joseph Shepard is underneath John Williams, who's the Associate Administrator of Investment and Innovation. And that's where that, the SBIR, STTR resides. So in further understanding that office, they work on um, the SBICs, they work on the SIBRs, STTRs, and the Growth Accelerator, Accelerator Fund competition. So that's the basic four areas that are under Joseph Shepard. 
And, and, you know, some of the reason why I want it's important to understand who's in charge of these things is I've been helping some of these federal agencies develop programs. So knowing who's responsible for what and where their role is with SBIRs helps me to guide people to know how to make things happen. And one office that I, I um, asked some folks if they were familiar with, and I've been kind of surprised because even a lot of the federal agencies are not aware that the SBA has an office of advocacy. And the SBA in general um, is where the SBDCs obviously reside, but this office of SBA advocacy is a totally separate office. It was um, established in 1976. And the chief counsel, who's the lead for advocacy, is appointed by the president, confirmed by Senate. The main things they do is economic research, regulation, regulatory reform, and regional outreach. And that's important to understand how we can use the Office of Advocacy. And I really think that the SBDCs having a connection with the Office of Advocacy is super important. Um, the structure is that it's headquartered out of DC, out of the SBA office, specifically SBA headquarters, but there are 10 regional offices um, in different areas, including a national rural affairs office and a manufacturing and technology advocate office. And then I'll talk further about um, the role. Go ahead. Um, so so how, how do they impact SBI and STTR? I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I was working with SOCOM, the head of S&T, and we were brainstorming ways to shorten the amount of time for SBIR awards. And her team shared with me that they had come up with ideas and pushed for pilots for years, but they could never get anything congressionally approved. And I shared with them this Office of Advocacy and how behind the scenes before um, anything can get approved, not anything, but most things can get approved, this Office of Advocacy reviews um, changes in legislation and, and has to determine whether that negatively impacts or, help or assists small businesses. So it's this office kind of behind the scenes that can hold up certain things from taking place if they don't fully understand that this is a really good thing for small business. So I happened to reach out to um, Chief Counsel, who I've known for 20 some years, explain to him that, that we were trying to come up with things that were better and helped small businesses and then made an introduction of the um, the SOCOM team to the um, advocacy team and they explained their program and lo and behold, um, they got their first congressionally approved pilot done. Now, you know, it may not have been solely because of advocacy that that got done, but it's important to know that there are things like that in, in an office behind the scenes approving those things. The other thing that I think is really important um, as these programs get developed, and as you probably guys know, I launched AFWorks for the Air Force. And there are some things that they're doing really good. There are some things that are negatively impacting small business, however. And if we can educate our small businesses and give them access and knowledge about this, this Office of Advocacy, if they give feedback to the Office of Advocacy and if the SBDC counselors give feedback to the Office of Advocacy, they can help push for change or perhaps change the next pilot that they're trying to review. And the Office of Advocacy holds round tables. I happen to see that they did a round table in Oklahoma. I don't know whether you guys in Kansas were aware of it or participated. When they have those round tables, they typically have small businesses and federal agencies at the table, and it's kind of a round table discussion. And there's also a way to provide feedback through the website. Um, but again, if the Office of Advocacy doesn't know if these pilot programs are doing good things or doing bad things, 
they, they're kind of flying blind on approving things. Um, and then the regional office, I did looked into it, the regional office that Kansas resides in is in Region 7. And the person in that regional office is Adrian Foster. I don't know Adrian, Adrian Foster, but I think it'd be worthwhile to reach out to her. And she's located in the Kansas City, Missouri office. So I, I would just encourage everybody to know that that um, office exists. And I would really encourage um, SBDC offices and states to know their office of advocacy. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to talk to Chief Counsel um, uh, next Thursday, or this Thursday, excuse me, um, and, and see what I can do to um, further introductions and get more information on advocacy and how he suggests states get involved with them to just make sure I'm not missing anything. So, so anyway, next slide. Um, so federal agencies and how they participate in SBIRs, I think it's important to note um, how that takes place. Um, any agency with a budget over 100 million um, participates in the SBIR program and know that as, as budgets fluctuate, so do SBIR budgets. So a lot of times when we see changes in um, administration, we see heavy focus in certain agencies over other agencies. So it's important to note that the budgets can really fluctuate on SBIR and STTR. And um, offices or these agencies, they are actually, a, a tax is put on their overall budget it's 3.2% for SBIRs and it's mandated by statute each year. And um, the, the latest statistic I have is 17 and in 16 for STTRs, 0.045% was established. And um, agencies can exceed their minimum and know that they can use their SBIR budget for other things besides just SBIR awards. I happen to know that agencies are beginning to use some of their SBIR budget to um, host events, and they're actually diverting SBIR funds and STRT fund, our funds that would be awarded to small business to actually put on these events. So there's not all the money is used just to make SBIR awards. It's, it's, they're, it's used in other ways. Go ahead, Alan. So participating federal agencies, I know you guys have seen these slides, um, this slide probably in particular, seven ways to Sunday, but the importance of this slide is to understand that um, each of these agencies have nuances. Some of them have um, really long timelines for awards. Some of them have big budgets. Some of them have small budgets. And it's really important to understand the, the ins and outs and nuances of these different federal agencies. And also know that in some instances, when businesses have a product, there can be multiple agencies that can play a role. And the best example I could find of that is the iPhone. When it came to the iPhone, um, the LCDs, actually funding came from NIH, NSF, and DOD to get that funded for the iPhone. The lithium-ion battery for the iPhone came from part um, funding from DOE. Um, the camera image sensor came from NASA. And then um, Siri was actually developed with the help of DARPA and touch screens were developed with funding from DOE, the CIA, and NSF. So know that a lot of times there's agencies out there that you don't know um, can be involved, but there's ways to research different things these folks have funded to um, get your education on that. And so, um, and there are also subject matter experts and folks out there um, that consultants, et cetera, 
that are experts in each of these fields. And I'm actually starting to ferret out folks that we can talk to, that we can help, that have either been on panels to select SBIRs or um, came from those agencies are and are now in a consulting position. So I'm going to kind of try to identify resources for each of these different agencies that we can kind of look to um, to get further education and or assistance um, on working with them. Go ahead, Alan. So I know you guys have also seen this slide um, a lot, but the reason why I wanted to highlight this is um, we all think about Department of Defense as being like the number one agency for SBIRs, but HHS, um, Health and Human Services, is also a really, really great place to get funding. Um, Department of Energy, again, another great place. So, um, we want to look at number one amount of funding and I think you all know that Air Force of the 1.3 billion Air Force has the majority of that it, it's around I think 900 million now eight to 900 million it, it varies and fluctuates um, so they're the biggest piece of DOD um, and there's a lot of little agencies that make up the 46 million so those are smaller agencies that might not be worth the time especially if if it's a long timeline, and, and I'll get into that in a minute, some of these folks have varying timelines and have really drawn out processes. So it can take up to 25 months for these people to get funding. Um, so if it's a low budget agency, it may not be worth the time to figure out how to crack the code on that agency. And also if it's a long timeline, it might not be worth focusing on that agency. So that's why it's really important to understand that. So, so I'm not sure if people understand how topics are selected and, and how this whole program is managed. And I'm gonna start with the management of DOD. There is a, actually an office out of um, the Department of Defense R&E. That's the Office of Small Business and Technology Partnerships. Um, and they oversee all of DOD's SBIR and STTR's funding. They don't manage the programs. They don't even touch the money. The, the Navy and the Air Force and all those folks are taxed. Then that money goes directly to them. But this office of um, small business technology partnerships is very important to the overall program. And I've had meetings and dialogue with them on um, giving them feedback. And they have a lot of influence in making improvements and changes with SBIRs, STTRs. So just know that that office exists. Um, the branches, Army, Navy, Air Force, whatever, they issue a data call. They ask their different um, directorates or subunits for topics. And that's really important to know because one of the best things these small businesses can do is have influence or somehow get to the folks that are interested in their product and have them submit their topic to their command as a potential topic area and get to know who those people are. And there's ways to research um, who's made awards, who's interested in different products, and, and, and look at getting to know those folks. And then you have them actually pull that agency to ask for your topic. That's probably one of the best ways to get funding under SBIRs. And then once a topic, um, actually all the topics come in, um, each agency has a different um, process for selecting final topics, but most of them utilize a board that's made of a subject matter experts. Some of them have internal agency folks. Some of them use outside subject matter experts, but there's a process there and all those processes are different. But sometimes it's good to know, um, again, how each one of them selects because you can have access to some of those folks on the board as well. So topics are selected and then published. Of course, there's also just sideline um, 
folks that do different things like the Air Force dual use, where it's kind of an open topic call, et cetera, and, and that's a different process. But um, overall, that's the process. So the, the life cycle is um, agency has a need, and, and most, most of the cyber topics are topics that the acquisition authorities can't find or buy. And it's, it's interesting to look at, and one of the things I would tell um, clients is to look for articles or um, publications that say that the, the government needs something and can't find it. That's a really, really telling thing that it's a great SBIR topic. Uh-oh. Oh, sorry, I blinked out for a minute. <laughs> um, and then um, the need is submitted to R&D. R&D recommends the CIBR, and I'm making this really simple. Um, the need is published to the public. Companies propose solutions. Um, phase one, the promising solution is funded. Phase two, concepts funded. The next is prototypes are evaluated. And one of the very, very most important steps, and we got to understand that this is the single most important step to small businesses, and that is the government then buys it, phase three. I think phase three is not talked about enough. It's not understood enough. And I can't tell you how many small businesses have called me and said, we're having great success getting phase one, we're having great success going to a direct to phase two, or we got a phase two after um, phase one. But the most important thing we care about is the government buy piece. And I really think that phase three, number 10, two small businesses is the most important thing. The phase one and phase two is a means to get to phase three, but there really needs to be a focus on phase three. Um, I've got Mike Shirley speaking next Tuesday, and they are a company by the name of Frontier Technologies. And that is their area of focus and expertise is helping small businesses get phase threes. There's other resources out there. And one of the things I'm going to do a deep dive research in is what other avenues do we have to help small businesses to get to phase threes? Are there other consultants, other, other companies? So we're gonna kind of learn the nuances of phase three, which again is probably the single most important thing to a small business. When can I get this phase three? Um, so cyber timelines, and, and again, th this is important to know when you're counseling these small businesses. The time frame, you got to tell these small businesses up front. Um, it can take between four and 10 months between publishing and need and phase one starting in these federal agencies. So if you're thinking about it, they publish in need and the small business proposes, they can wait to up to 10 months. And I've heard of situations where it's even longer than that. I will tell you that a lot of agencies are trying to pilot programs. Air Force is probably the biggest one. Um, I told you that SOCOM is now piloting a new program and, and she's gonna be a speaker Friday, September 11th. Lisa Saunders, the head of s and for SOCOM is going to um, educate us on her pilot that she got approved. And she has significantly cut down on the amount of time. And, and for SIVRs to be valuable for small business, these timelines have got to be cut down. So there's a big focus on doing that. But as it stands right now on the average, um, up to 10 months, and then it can take up to 15 months between completing um, a phase one and starting a phase two. So if you think about it, these small businesses can have up to 25 months from the time they saw that published phase one and they get started on phase two. And that is just an unbelievable amount of time when you look at the dollar funding, it's, it's really challenging um, for these small businesses. So um, I just need everybody to understand that timeline. And again, it varies with agencies. And I actually have some information on the different agencies 
that I'm hoping to share with you guys later so that it'll be broken down with even more information so you have an education on which agencies are quicker and which agencies aren't. Um, and, 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 and just with a broad brush, what we've seen is the fastest timelines are through the Air Force dual use program and HHS. So um, those are quicker timelines. Some of the slowest average timelines that I've seen are through USDA, NSF, and the DOD standard BAA program, from what I've seen, have some of the slowest average timelines. So when advising these companies, these companies need to understand that, you know, those, the USDA, NSF, and DOD standard programs could be potentially those agencies that take up to up to 25 months to get to starting a phase two. Again, that amount of time before these guys see results and return on investment. Um, as far as customers go, and this is another really important thing when counseling these small businesses, they have to understand that the SIBR program is not typically um, something that leads to fast money. Um, again, there's some exceptions to that. We see programs where people get the money fast, but again, it's that first money. It's not the end result. Understand that. Um, so they should not go into this thinking this is a great way to get fast money. They should think of this as, um, a potential almost like buying a lottery ticket that hey this could happen but i'm not counting on it if it happens it'll be a big help and it's a great thing and a blessing but not counting on it um, and companies that are a best fit are companies that have an existing r d company so so um, we should look to clients that already have the existing R&D company. They already have existing product designs. And the other thing is that they have multiple products because once you start to learn this SBIR product um, process, uh, the best fits for this are companies that can go from one product to the next to the next. Um, it's typically um, a good fit for them and also possess a deep and broad technology capabilities. So a really broad-based team that has deep, deep capabilities. Those are your best fits for SBIRs. The companies that are not good fits for SBIRs are candidates with limited or shallow credibility that company kind of nobody knows about. Um, the individuals behind it have limited business experience and absolutely not companies that are struggling for funding and thinking that this is the way they're going to get funding. This should be money that's added on to the company, not this is the means to the end for funding. It's also not typically a good fit for companies who own one product and not a good fit for someone wanting to start a company in the future. Um, across agencies, the chances of winning phase ones varies, of course, um, but typically the chances of winning a phase one SBIR is 15%, and the chances of winning a phase two is 50%. I have not been able to find anything on a statistic of winning phase threes, but I intend to ask Mr. Shirley, who's speaking next week, because he may very well have that statistic since that's his big focus area is phase threes. So we need to ask him that next Tuesday when we have him on the line. So, so, um, actually, I, made a big mistake on this um, slide. This is actually, um, oh, actually I was supposed to have not a good fit next. So I, I'll go through that. Maybe it's out of order, but products that are best fit for SBIRs is a product with upfront development costs and high risks. When the government has a need that none of their contractors can provide. And again, when you start seeing a lot of published information regarding the need for a product, that's when a product is a best fit. Alan, will you go back to the next slide? I think somehow I dropped off a slide. 
Oh, I did go through that. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alan. Next slide from here. So I thought this was kind of interesting. These are products that are developed by the government. And when thinking about um, this slide, I want you to know that, that these, you have to think about the times here. Um, these products are basic products, but back in the times, these were not basic off the shelf products. So um, one of the products is the t-shirt or the undershirt. That was actually developed in 1904 that prior to that, undergarments were really only being um, sold to bachelors and young men out in the field. And the Navy picked up on that being a great part of the uniform. So in 1904, the Navy put forth the funding to fund t-shirts and to make that part of their uniform. So um, again, something that didn't exist at all, there was minimal um, resources out there to get it, and they then decided they wanted it as part of the uniform. The uh, Jeep was actually developed in World War II because um, the Army needed a um, lightweight reconnaissance vehicle, and back then they didn't have like um, standard army vehicle companies that they looked to. So it was actually an unknown company by the name of American Bantam Car Company that developed the Jeep from the army. And of course now today the Jeep has taken over as a product line, et cetera. But back then they did not have a lightweight reconnaissance vehicle and there was a huge need for it. And so that's why that was developed. Um, the microwave actually um, was founded in 1946 and used for satellite radar. And Raytheon um, mistakenly discovered that it could melt chocolate. And then in 1954 is when they brought it um, to the forefront as the microwave oven and got funding to bring us the microwave oven. So no such thing existed and it actually started as something totally different. Um, and then AVVR, um, virtual reality, was um, brought forth by the government in 1979. Of course, we all know it was kind of a source of entertainment. And then the government said, you know, we really need training for aviation. How can we take that and use it for aviation? So when you think of products that are good candidates for SBIR and government funding, you really need to think of things that, that are very, very different products not something that is off the shelf, readily available, and somebody just, you know, wants to start breaking into an existing market. Go ahead, Alan. So in, in counseling clients, I think probably one of the best things that, that we can do is come up with a, a, a chart and the um, resources to provide to these small businesses, to give them what is probably the um, best way. Can you guys hear me? I keep flashing out. I don't know if you're all flashing out. I hear you. Or I did. Uh, my screen just went out a minute ago. Um, is, is to give them what is probably the best kind of steps for um, pursuing SBIR, but not making it a huge time consuming effort. So um, assess if SBIR is a fit and assess um, all of those first things. Are you the kind of company that is a good fit? And what I'm looking at putting together and, and gonna start working on is a really quick survey with five or six things that to ask your SBIR clients to help them with that. And then is your product a good fit? Without even getting into technology and digging into it, help them assess whether it's a good fit. If SBIRs are a good fit, um, one of the things I would encourage these businesses to do is download an app by the name of FedScout. It's free. 
and it's available on the Apple Store. And that will help them um, create searches and relevant alerts on opportunities within all the federal agencies. They're all coordinated and available through that um, Fed Scout app. I've never used it myself, but I heard it's just a great app. Um, if companies are pursuing dual use off work sivers, they should start looking into customer discovery. And again, um, I said earlier, one of the best scenarios for these small businesses is to have a customer in mind to help pull them along. And that's true whether it's AFWorks, Cyber, um, dual use, or any Cyber. If you have that customer in mind that can help you pull that product forward, that's the best scenario. Um, and then if, if traditional SBIR assess alignment between topics and commercial goals, because it's really best if, again, there's perfect alignment. If you've got to really deviate your product to get it into the government, it, again, might not be the best avenue. And then help them assess whether it's worth investing the time and the money. Again, keep in mind, these agencies have, um, some of them have really long timelines, some have shorter, but these guys are going to be investing 100 hours per proposal on the average. As time goes on, they'll get, probably get better at writing these proposals, but typically when a small business gets started, it's 100 plus hours. Um, in getting the proposal together. And if all of these things check out, then um, I would encourage these companies to write a proposal. But I really think that this assessment needs to, or this information should be provided to these small businesses. This is the best way to go about it in general. So writing a proposal, the basics, can't emphasize enough. Find your customer identify that there really is a customer. And you can do that a lot of different ways, either by going to events. I, I talked to some of the folks out of the OSD small business office that are involved with RIF and SBIRs. Their, their, their best advice was to go to like AUSA for Army, to go to big Air Force conferences, look for the places where those SBIR people exist, find out how to research, um, SBIRs that have been placed before, look at what commands and branches and customer contacts have funded different projects and find those people that have funded projects like yours and find those customers. It's a lot of work, trust me. This does not happen easily. It's very time consuming, but it's doable. And um, so, so there's a lot of different ways to find customers, but important. Um, you next structure your proposal, plan content, um, decode all of the proposal instructions. And what's very confusing is all these federal agencies have different instructions, different ways they do it. Um, and again, what I'm um, looking at putting together is resources that we can look to to help um, come up with further decoding by agency on these proposals and the ins and outs of the agencies. Um, build your budget. There are also resources out there that can help these small businesses build a budget. Consultants that specifically specialize in the accounting side and budget side. Um, and, and we're gonna build a, a list of those resources. Complete registrations and administrative hurdles. The PTAC is a great place for that. Um, the only thing I will caution that I've learned over the years is some PTACs are more knowledgeable than others. Some counselors are better than others. Some states have better PTAC folks, but the PTAC is a great way to do that and, and to steer these small businesses. And then what I can't emphasize enough that I think we really, really need to talk about is consider assistance on proposals for these small businesses. 
And there are different ways to get funding for these folks. And I'm doing a deep dive in research on, um, on how to um, help Kansas get access to what some of these funding resources are. So, Laurie, we have a question. Uh, someone, ha uh, Fabian, has asked, "Can you give more details about the customer discovery?" Uh, I, I, and I would like to propose maybe one of the opportunities. Uh, and sh I noticed Sherry Geegan was on. I'm not sure if she's still on. Uh, with I that she might could speak to ICOR, but uh, what are some? Uh, what would you say are some ways they can? Uh, enhance their ability for customer discovery? Again, I would encourage small businesses to look at um, the history on SBIRs, who's made awards for what products and look for matches. And also, again, do research on the web to find out who out there is talking about wanting um, wanting the technology that you have. It's research, research, research. And, and what I'm gonna talk about next is one of the resources um, available out there, although it, you have to apply for it at the time that you're um, applying for an SBIR. And I really think the best thing is to find the customer in advance. But, um, you can actually um, use the funding I'm going to talk about next to do market research. So um, these tech scouts, a lot of times, Alan, that you bring forth, um, they've got insights. And, and I would, given the opportunity to talk to these tech scouts, I would ask them, can you tell me what federal agencies you think are a fit and can you give me contacts within those federal agencies? And, and as Alan and I have been discussing, um, one of the things that I am um, going to be working on moving forward is coming up with some um, tools and names and numbers and people that can be resources for SBDC counselors so that we can be a really good help to these small businesses on, for instance, each of these steps finding a customer, structuring a proposal, um, building that budget. They're, these are all steps that, that we really need to find tools to help with to make sure their proposals are right. And I've had discussions also with um, folks that I know very well that have been in charge of SBIRs. And one of the things that they really, really emphasize is no, find a customer that you know has the need, make sure you fully understand what that need is, and one of the best things you can put in content of your proposal, you have got to, got to demonstrate to that customer that your product meets that need, the need that they've been talking about. Don't just talk about your product. And, and what I've heard from these reviewers is so often these companies and their SBIRs spend tons of time explaining their product, which is good. I'm not saying they don't need to, need to, to do that, but they spend not enough time on convincing the command that that customer meets their specific need. We always find the best fit when the customer knows they need it and you match what your product can do to meet the need. Don't just tell them about the product and what all your product can do. Focus it on fitting that customer's need. Did that answer the question? I don't know if they have any way of responding, but. Yeah, I, I don't either. It says, they said yes. Okay. Um, this next slide is about a program that I have to tell you, it's a fairly new program. And I really struggled with getting information, even from people that, that, have part, that are in these federal agencies. 
what they have told me is this is all developing and that there's some information out there, but it's constantly changing and being tweaked. And it is the TABA program, the Technical and Business Assistance Program. Um, previously, it was known as the Direct Technical Assistance Program. And what it is meant to do is to assist awardees with commercialization um, activities. And my understanding, and again, I need to do further research. I started just scratching the surface on this, but I am gonna do a deep dive on this topic to get even further information on how we can get the Kansas SBDC and C's and other SBDCs um, totally educated on this and know exactly how we can know what proposals um, are available for TABA and how to counsel these people because there are so many ins and outs with this TABA. First of all, I guess some proposals that get released will state that this proposal has TABA funding available. And sometimes they have TABA um, funding available on phase ones. Sometimes they have TABA funding available on phase twos. Um, and it's published at the time on these proposals. Some federal agencies are participating in this TABA program, some are not. And I don't know yet if um, all agencies are gonna get on board with this, um, but, and there, there are consulting experts out there on TABA, but again, in talking to even the federal agencies that are involved with SBIRs, um, they've said this is a really constant changing program and they couldn't even answer all my questions. So um, anyway, uh, and you need to, at the time, if you go for TABA, you have to have a third party selected that's going to counsel you on this TABA work. Some federal agencies have pre-selected TABA folks to counsel. Some federal agencies let the small business select their own TABA counselors. And, and I know some folks, and then one of the, the, one of the next slides are coming up, I'm gonna go over who some of those folks are um, that are really knowledgeable about TABA and can help further. Um, but anyway, they could be used as potential counselors. Um, so, um, and then the amount of money available varies phase one um, up to 6,500, phase two varies from 5,000 to 50,000. And, and know that there is a little nuance in TABA funding, that if you participate in TABA funding, you are excluded from any further commercialization funding to help companies on the back end if you get TABA funds. However, not all federal agencies have commercialization funding assistance available. So knowing what agencies have commercialization funding on the back end and ones that don't is also another part of this. So, so anyway, I just wanted to give you a broad brush to know that this program exists and that um, I'm going to be doing deep dive um, research on this from several different resources to demystify and make sure that there is a connection to be alerted as this program unfolds and changes over time because it's changing constantly from what I'm being told. So Laurie, we have a question on any information on the phase zero funding. I, and I think the TABA kind of ties into some of the assistance, but how different do you see phase zero to the TABA at this point? Right now, TABA, you can only get TABA when you are actually applying for an SBIR phase one or two. My, that's my understanding of the program as it exists now. It's, it, it, it's, not, it, it's at the time when you're applying and it has to be published that that's available. 
Okay. And then phase zero. I may corrected, but that's what I got told, and in, in that's what I found in research. Okay. And then phase zero would be just for the, the pre uh, phase one selection for those, for those organizations or those agencies that are offering phase zero. Yeah, I, I do not believe, and again, I'll, I'll, as I do more research, I'll find out, but I've been told it's for phase one and phase two, not phase zero. I might stand corrected after doing further research. And it may have changed since I did my research because again, oh. um, I mean, I've, I talked to a federal agency that's involved in SBIRs as recently as Sunday and um, they couldn't answer a bunch of my questions because it's all evolving. Oh. So, so there are some folks out there that are really knowledgeable about TABA. Um, LARDA Institute is one. Greenwood Consulting is another one. Um, and, and I put together these consultants and, and I think it's really important that we develop and grow this list. Um, and I'm working on that as we speak. I have been talking to other states. Um, I'm very familiar with the BBC. I understand you guys had BBC at Lunch and Learn. I'm from Michigan and BBC resides out of Ann Arbor. So I've known BBC for years. I know they're credible. I know they do a great job so that I have them on the list. Um, Dawnbreaker, I know is a great resource. They're actually doing the SBIR um, Roadshow. Um, they're very involved. They are an approved TABA source for certain federal agencies. So I know they're very knowledgeable on TABA in some respects. Um, uh, Foresight Science and Technology, I got raving reviews from Montana on them. Um, same as LARDA. And the three people I listed next are um, not companies, but consultants. And um, they too are very knowledgeable and helpful um, for small businesses in SBIRs. Um, there are a bunch of other people I'm in the midst of sorting through. Um, for instance, I have an accelerator um, that I am fairly familiar with, but I wanna get a deep dive information from them out of Louisville. I would highly recommend them. Um, for anything um, HHS related. They not only um, are funded by NIH um, to assist small businesses, I just got to get do a deep dive into how companies can apply and get involved. They also have a um, investment side um, to their um, accelerator and um, I just want to find all these resources. I also have um, a great individual I know that that resides in a capacity of um, reading and scoring um, NSF SBIRs. Um, so he's got great insight. He had told me he would be more than willing to educate um, SBDCs on NSF and demystify to the best of his ability what he looks at as a proposal reviewer. And he told me he would make himself available um, for SBDC to better understand NSF and all the ins and outs of NSF because he's a reviewer. And so I'm, I'm doing a deep dive and digging into who those people are. And it's my plan to bring those people forward and um, help demystify even further things. Uh, I was telling Alan, I had so much information that I wanted to share. I was trying to share some of the, the things that I was hoping, the nuances that you guys haven't learned of before, such as advocacy, um, such as, you know, TABA, and I can't, um, I can't express enough how important it is for us to put together a process um, that helps the SBDC counselors be more effective. I know you guys are pulled in a million directions. You've got a million companies wanting help. So what needs to happen is the development of a very 
easy step-by-step -step process of, of really who should you encourage and being able to determine that really quickly. And then um, if it's somebody that you want to encourage, is there a way of getting them consulting? And again, I told you I'm looking for avenues to get funding for consulting, um, all the different ways I can do that within federal agencies um, for these small businesses. And then, um, and then also ways that, that I can help you guys better um, prepare these companies and, and figure out how to do those steps that I outlined in the proposal writing process. If I can identify the best resource and the best steps in doing that market research, who's your customer, I want to outline what those resources are and make that readily available so that you guys have a tool that says, here's the steps and here's the resources you can give your small businesses for each of those steps. And so that's one of the things that I'm strategically working through. And I can't also emphasize enough that in a lot of instances, um, if these businesses can get outside consultants to help them, a lot of times when you look at the return on investment, that may very well be the best way that, that the SBDC helps these folks is, um, is, is giving them good consultants that they can talk to. I've talked to a number of states. I'm trying to figure it out how different states are handling SBIRs. And what I've determined is some of the states, the SBDCs are really not the main resource that's helping them actually get the SBIRs. Um, they've just set up the right ecosystem so that they can hand these clients over to these tools that they've developed and they're having great success with, with not taxing their SBDC counselors. And I think that's the name of the game. We both want results. We want the SBDC counselors to get results in the easiest way possible and most effective way possible. And we want these companies to get results and that means contracts. So um, the goal that I'm striving for is to put together a process, pull together the right tools to get not only SBIR phase ones, phase twos, but not to miss the fact that the end game here is, is um, awards. These guys need contracts. And so um, that I think we haven't spent enough time, at least I haven't seen a lot of people spend a lot of time on that. Um, but, but, but there are some mousetraps out there. Um, again, our first exposure to an option is gonna be Tuesday um, with Mike Shirley from Frontier Technologies. And they are an award-winning SBA company, by the way, at uh, Frontier Technologies is, so. So questions, I know that was a lot of information. I, I again was trying to get to things that you guys haven't heard in the past um, and know that I'm gonna do a deeper dive in all of this and bring forth more information is my intent. So we've got, we've got a, a couple of questions and then I need to make sure Mindy that I turn this over to you. So uh, you may need to make sure to tell me how to do that. So. Uh, one question, Laurie, Congress and multiple service agencies have sought our company, our company product uh, service, uh, but their need it is never, it's never been placed in SBIR. How do I get the agency to submit the need into SBIR phase one? So you already have the customer, I'm taking it, you know where that resides. Um, I, I'd love to know what agency that is. <laughs> and know whether I have a contact there and look and see if there's um, somebody I can guide you to talk to. It all comes down to getting somebody motivated within that agency to want to pull that product forward. Um, and, and, and again, if they haven't discovered it as a need, and, and it may be, by the way, 
it may be that there's an agile acquisition contract out there that is a better mousetrap. Um, it's Air Force Mobility Command. Interesting. I, I would love to talk to Dwight at some point and find out more because I might be able to help um, do it. Well, in, ge in general, what would you say are, are some of the steps? Again, if it were me and I know that there is um, Air Force Mobility Command, there's a way to research and see what awards have already been made. And I've got to get further information on that um, so that I can teach clients how to go in and do that research within the, the SBIR system. But there's a way to get to the POCs within that system. And, and actually the, the, the OSD small business office was not even up to date on where that was at. So I, I have to do further research, but, but there is a means to get to um, where have products like that been funded before and who's the point of contact on those contracts. And that's who I would be calling within air mobility command. I would be calling that person and see who's been pulling Sibbers in. Um, because it's, it's funny, you'll see within agencies, um, I've been told this guy's really motivated, they're the expert on this product, I know the agency wants it, but that person will never return my call, and I was making the call on behalf of a small business. So you have to find the right person that is a big supporter of SBIRs, that is in that topic area, that, that has the authority, by the way, to pull in and has access to that um, RD&E panel, um, R&D panel um, to submit. So um, it's, it's complicated, I know, but, but there are ways to do it and it, it, it takes a lot of research. That's why I keep saying sometimes SBIRs are not the best avenue because of the amount of time it takes. And that's just what I was going to point out with whoever this is. Uh, you're, you're talking from what I've seen in the past. If you can find the right program manager to, to express this and they decide to, to post this, you've got to wait for that cycle to come back around for them to have your, uh, your focus uh, posted where they can turn around and uh, apply. Right, so that's, it may not be worth the time and effort. And so there may be better avenues like getting to know PIA folks or, or OTAs. Within OSD, you've got a big cornerstone OTA, which is just kind of getting started. And I'm hopefully going to be very much further involved with in the future. But it's going to be, it's got 15 topic areas. And they can easily put things on contract. And OSD has the contracting mechanism. And I'm kind of getting into a lot of um, big picture stuff. But it's hard to get, um, even a lot of times when a federal agency wants your product and you find that point of contact, one of the first things they'll ask is, what's your contracting mechanism? So that would be another whole education um, that I can provide because there are contracting mechanisms and there's ways to get involved in those contracting mechanisms. And I'm so, actually trying to help develop more of those avenues. So for, for our uh, Kansas folks, uh, I want to encourage you to know that we're, Laurie and I are talking about and she's going to be working with us through our CARES Act uh, funding to assist us in in the other funding opportunities for commercialization uh, for everyone else. Uh, this is something that she's working on. Just like she said, we we want to understand and learn and profile. I think if we can hedge our bets as to uh, like I told her earlier, we were talking about assessing a client, and the thought was, well, if a client doesn't qualify then send them on their way and so well we can truly give them their next best step it'd be just like a, someone coming in to see me and i told her as an example they come in to see me and i've got their credit score and they want to open a restaurant and i ask them how much do you 
uh, will you need and do you have all that money? No, I don't. Will you need to borrow it? Yes, I will. Then I know what your next best step is. You need to go see a credit counselor and work on your credit because you're not ready. No one's going to loan you money right now. And so the same thing with our SBIR. Uh, we've got a client that I told her about that I spoke to yesterday, and they have won an SBIR. Uh, they have not uh, created that product but after the SBIR. Another uh, Prime came out with that product, and now they have a contract to deliver basically that product. And they said, we don't, they're not going to be willing to spend the money uh, expanding. And so they're going and utilizing that product, but they are, they are going through the steps and at the same time they're trying to operate or, or produce that product, they have a service and that's how they're making their income. So you can, uh, to Lori's point, if you're a one product or a one hit pony and you can, and someone takes, or, or as I've said before, I've asked people, do you think you're one in a million? If you are uh, in the United States, there's 330 others just like you. Uh, so if someone else is thinking of your product and, and your innovation slightly different, that doesn't, and they have the capability to pull it off and you're, that's your only bet, then there's a good chance someone else is going to beat you to the, to, uh, to the end. And so you've got to be able to have another product or service along the way. If you don't have that as counselors, we need to be encouraging our, our uh, clients that, that you need to be looking at uh, expanding or partnering. I think joint venturing or partnering is a big part. If you go back to all of our clients that we've seen just in encountering innovation the last three years, now four coming up, and added how many of those have not opened or started their service, it would, I think it would be astounding if we go back and say, what are you doing to try to uh, expand or operate beyond just that service or that product? And it's one of the things I think we need to be encourage, encouraging clients, which is one of the things we're doing with this year's virtual conference is trying to help people uh, network better to where we can start building a better team with some of our innovators, that their answer doesn't lie just in themselves. Uh, there was a question uh, that I saw, Laurie, that, uh, uh, can, that can I Can I add one thing to that comment, Alan, just before sure. we get to the next question? I, I can tell you that I have worked very closely with heads of SBIR offices. I've even had meetings with Molly Walsh in the Pentagon, who's over all DOD SBIRs. And one of the things that they too are frustrated about is that they get the topic areas. And believe me, these folks that reside in these SBIR offices want these small businesses to be successful and they want these products to be commercialized. But one of their biggest frustrations is that a lot of times because of the amount of time it takes for these small businesses and they know they've invested tons of time is it before the time that they get all the way through phase two and they actually have a product the government has either found a different solution or changed their mind that they don't need that solution anymore yeah. they expressed that to me big time, which is why, again, um, I've been working, I have quite frankly been working both sides. I've been helping the government, you know, back in days at Defense Works, I was helping the government trying to cut down on the amount of time of these awards and uh, improve SBIRs. They all know this needs to be improved. So, so knowing that, again, I would be very cautious about um, this assessment, I think has to be put in place. I already started it. There's probably gonna be five different levels of companies, um, you, know, in, you know, how much encouraging, how good a fit are they all the way down to not a fit at all. I think there's about five different steps to that, but you know, we've got to really be able to say, you know, you're a great candidate for this. Let me oh. really help you get that done and blah, blah, blah. But the folks like the, the company you just talked about, Alan, you know, they really need to be told this is not a good pro fit for you. Oh. And, and maybe we have alternative programs for them. And, and that's kind of 
again, another thing I'm working on, but um, we don't want to turn anybody away, but we don't want to invest a lot of time and effort in these folks that are just not a good fit. Right. So sorry, I hope I didn't go on, but I just wanted no, to. No, I, I agree. I think uh, uh, Jim Greenwood, one of your consulting uh, groups that you're talking about, Jim has uh, come through WSU and I think Carl Klein uh, at, at uh, Washburn uh, and I'm not sure of Johnson County, but he's been around several times. And one of the things he's talked about is it, with, with this program is trying to understand the, the opportunity uh, for the grant versus the, the, the length of time that it takes and the amount of investment that you're putting yourself into when you get through your SBIR phase one, basically you lost money. Your SBIR phase two, you break even. And basically SBIR, as you call it, SBIR phase three, which is really just selling uh, exclusively to the, uh, to the government, that that's where you make money. And if all you're doing is getting several SBIR phase ones, and then eventually every once in a while a phase two, you're not getting anywhere. And we've seen uh, clients who have done that and they realize it's been a, it's been a job and it, that's good. But if you're trying to grow your business, you've got to go beyond that. And we've got to figure out a way to help our clients in doing that and realizing that the SBIR is not the ultimate win. It's a good thing. It can help if it's done right. Uh, so the next one, I agree. I think the hardest is getting an MOU. Is conferences the best way to make those connections when you have limited to no military connections? And uh, I'll t I will, I'll say from the Encountering Innovation Conference point of view, it's an incredibly effective way and very low risk. Uh, when you come to, to the in Encountering Innovation, we have all your documents that we're helping you to that we're helping to produce for you, and they're segregated. You have private documents, your quad chart information paper and pitch deck, and your public document, your your public bluff, bottom line up front, and your poster board. That way, you we help you segregate public and private. You have your pitch which is private. And then you have your networking and your poster boarding, which is public. If you can understand public and private, and I don't mean that facetiously, if you understand your IP and that the fact of your conversation should be about the benefit, what you're delivering, not the how you're delivering it, then if you can talk to that way, then I think uh, the conferences and especially uh, encountering innovation, we saw Tech Connect, which is how I met Brett Sharinghouse and how this all began. Uh, at Tech Connect, it's more of what I call, or it has been in the past, more of a Wild West show. I love it. I think it's a cool program. But if you're going there and you're pitching, you're pitching in front of tech scouts as well as uh, possibly competitors or adversaries. And if you're sharing with them just enough of the idea that they go, well, I know how to do that, then that's all you need to do in order to give them a jump forward. And if they have the resources to go along with that idea, then they can speed past you very quickly. And so you've got to know who your audience is and who to go to. In Encountering Innovation, those tech scouts, because you took the time and because we prepped you right, they the theory of reciprocity kicks in very well, and they do an excellent job of trying to refer you to the right people to where you can move forward, even if it's not in their chain of command. Okay, well, and, and the fact that you're doing the training for um, for all of that to have that very concise presentation that's inval that's really valuable to have somebody that is you know that you've got that education because these folks have just a barrage of small businesses at them trying to get their attention. And when you've got a very concise bluff and you're getting the training on how to deliver that appropriately, that's really important. So, and, and you know, the other thing to understand, there, there are so many things going on right now, so many changes taking place. I think most of you know probably that I launched AFWorks. I launched the first hub and was the first to launch that program. And it's morphed 
and it's going to morph again. There's a whole change coming um, that is not worked out yet, but but there's a lot of input that I think um, we can give to help improve upon all these programs. And so if we're working it from the side that they understand that their programs need to change um, and, and we're working to bring the best tools forward for these small businesses, that's a great scenario. So, and, and I think Lisa Saunders, the head of S&T, SOCOM is sharing her pilot September 11th. She is super open-minded. She takes my call at the drop of a hat and I love giving her feedback. Lisa, the pilot was great, but I heard from these companies that this didn't work well. Could we tweak this? Can we do that? She's way open to that. And so um, just know that I am opening up those avenues to number one, bring you guys the best information, but hopefully have an impact on helping those agencies change their programs. That's what I've been doing all along. So, uh, so Laurie, on your slide deck, I didn't notice, did you, did you leave contact information how you want to be reached if someone has a question? No, I did not. Um, we can, I'm, I'm happy to share it. However you think is the best way to share it. Anybody can have my contact information. I, so I, what we'll do, uh, what we'll do is we'll make, we'll, we'll add it to your slide deck on, on the thanks. Okay. So uh, just to let everyone know, if you're wanting to reach out to Laurie, we'll make sure to add that where you can have the information uh, available. We are doing our next uh, training next Tuesday. And you said, as you said earlier, that's going to be Mike Shirley on phase three. And yes, and they're a private company, and he's going to explain phase three, how it works. Um, it, it, I mean, there's a fee for it, but in a, in a way that they do it. But I'll tell you, as many companies, my phone rings off the hook that, hey, I did a phase two, and we never get phase threes. So it may very well be worth it. And um, so he's going to educate us on that program. And I'm going to do deep dive research to see what other companies are out there doing that. I, I've known Mike for years from another um, connection. But it's, so they're reputable. They're a great company. They're located by Wright Pat Air Force Base. Um, so that's why I have him coming forward. So I'm as anxious to learn about his program and how this works as you guys are. Um, but I think it's going to be really important to understand that because that's the holy grail is the contracts. And, and again, I'm not saying that phase three contracts are the best way to get a contract for all companies either, but in some instances, it's a pretty good, good mechanism. So, um, we need to learn more about that. So I'm encouraging everyone. I know we have uh, two or three that, off the top of my head that have uh, won phase twos. I think every one of uh, our advisors that have a, a client that has won a phase two, this would be a great opportunity to reach out to them, to talk to them, to where you have someone on your mind, to where when we go back and listen to this next week, we have an avenue or, or a case study to utilize to go back and try to exercise through this phase three. I don't see any other questions. I uh, need to remind everyone that Mindy will be sending out uh, the satisfaction survey. Is that correct, Mindy, with your information? Yeah, I'll be sending out a copy of this presentation as well as the webinar assessment, so the satisfaction survey. And I will also be sending out a link to register for next week's presentation. Great. That's so, where I do this. 10, 10, American Idol. There we go. Yeah. I, I, will, I will tell you, Laurie has, uh, the, the first time she worked with us, she, she reached out within two days and said, so uh, what are the results? She was looking for information. She actually uh, uh, surprised me, quite honestly, how inquisitive she was as to what's working, what isn't, is it, uh, what are they saying about this, uh, which is encouraging. Uh, so please give us feedback. Some, uh, we get, we've gotten great remarks uh, and great marks 
but we've had very few, uh, in my opinion, I, the, compared to the audience. So if you get a chance or when you get that opportunity, please go in and give uh, feedback fairly fairly simply. It's not very complicated. So please give us good feedback where we can, can move forward with it. And can I make one more request of the folks on the phone? I want to know what is valuable to you. What do you, what helps you and, and what do you want to know more about? Because I've got access to the right folks and, and, you know, I, I don't have all the answers. I, I don't never pretend to have all the answers. There's so much information out there. I try really hard to bring information that I think is valuable to you guys. And, and that's, what's important. I need to make this worth your time and um, to really bring good information forward that makes your job more effective. That's the bottom line. So, so please give me feedback. If there's topics, if there's things that, you know, you want to know more about, let me know because I, I need to know what helps you. Cool. Well, we've had uh, some that are talking about that uh, you're pheno phenomenal, lots of great information and appreciate your tenacity. And I would agree. So we appreciate, I'm glad we had a good group from Kansas and across uh, that we're on today. I, I agree with you, uh, with those that are on. What, how, how can we help you with the, with the client you have in mind with some of the stuff that you're struggling with? What, what do you need that we could help open or de demystify? Uh, we're going to be working hard through the CARES Act funding ongoing with our existing businesses that have had negative impact. So we're going to be working with them through this process over the next few months beyond encountering innovation. So your input would be great to, to know. Thanks. All right, I think we're done. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Laurie.